Well, good morning, uh, everyone. We have a very special speaker today. We have Professor Joachim Luther from, um, well, Professor Luther is probably known to many of you. Um, for 13 years, he was director of the Fraunhofer Institute for Solar Energy Systems in Freiburg. Um, after, uh, after that, he um, helped found CERIS in Singapore, the Solar Energy Research Institute of Singapore, and uh, was director of that until quite recently. Um, so prof the other thing I think um, that I'm particularly interested in Professor Luther's career has been his, uh, the time that he spent uh, on the German Advisory Council on Global Change. And um, they produced this report on, on energy, possible energy scenarios for the future that um, I found very useful in trying to um, convince people that um, solar energy scenarios for the future are, are realistic. And, um, and I think it's been very influential report in giving technical, technical credibility to a future that has a large amount of solar energy involved in it. So I'll leave it up to Professor Luther to explain the rest. The transformation of energy systems towards sustainability experiences gained in Germany. Thank you. Yes, thanks Martin. Uh, welcome to my talk. Uh, I thought it doesn't make a lot of sense if I'm talking about technology here because I think this is a baptized community. Uh, I rather thought uh, that I'd sh uh, share with you some ideas, some experience from, from Germany uh, about the transformation of an energy system in an industrialized country towards sustainability. Uh, there is not only Germany doing this, there are other countries. Uh, Japan has been strong in this area, the Scandinavian countries, in particular Denmark. But I'm talking about Germany simply because I'm German <laughs> and uh, all the data are readily available to me. So it's not a unique ac activity or approach uh, we have in Germany. So I will start with two slides uh, and these slides will explain a little why some countries are doing it and why it makes sense to transform today's energy systems towards, sustainab towards sustainability. And the main uh, um, uh, ingredients of this transformation will be uh, the application or the deployment of renewable energies, but I wrote the sustainable uh, use of uh, renewable energies because we have to be very careful how we deploy uh, solar energy, wind energy, biomass and so forth. And in any case, energy efficiency is crucial. Yeah? And, uh, both the, the deployment of renewable energies and energy efficiency should go hand in hand. So this is initial remarks. And then the first point, uh, the, oh now I see it here, the protection of the natural life support system. This is of course the climate uh, uh, issue, uh, CO2, but not only CO2, it's methane as well and other energy related e emissions. And uh, this is the climate problem. Then uh, reduction of poverty in developing countries, promotion of peace. I think this is obvious to all of you. But there is a but. In particular, the first point, the first benefit can only be harvested if more or less everybody does it, at least the main emitters. And there can be some doubt yeah, that all the main emitters or producers of uh, uh, fossil fuels really uh, embark into such a strategy to reduce um, uh, these uh, emissions and to support uh, our uh, natural life support system. Uh, so this is this is the question mark. And then you might ask yourself, but why is, for example, in Germany doing it uh, and other countries? There are other reasons, and these reasons are maybe not that important for the public. Uh, for the population of these countries, but they are important for politics because policy has to drive the activities. And first of all, this is increasing the security of energy supply. If a country does not have a lot of resources, like for example Australia, uh, then if you uh, really produce energy, and with this I mean terawatt hours, not megawatt hours, terawatt hours, uh, then you could work on the security of your uh, energy supply. And this applies, for example, to, to Germany and to Italy and to Denmark, just to, to, or to Japan, just to mention three of these. The second point is reducing the uncertainties in, in cost of energy supply. You know there is quite a volatility and on the average 
energy prices are, uh, our cost and prices are, are increasing. But this will not be the case in solar energy or in wind energy because you have to do the upfront investment and if you have done this upfront investment then you can perfectly calculate, plus minus a margin of course, what will be the cost uh, of the energy supply in the next 20 years, say. So this is uh, really important and the third point is for highly industrialized technology-based countries as well, uh, future compliant uh, uh, jobs and, uh, and industry. What do you sell in 10 years time to the world market? Maybe not just Mercedes cars, maybe there are other ideas. So these, these points, they are not really frequently discussed, but <coughs> one has to have this in mind. This is underlying when it comes to political uh, discussions. So, a transformation costs money. And uh, sometimes you read in the newspapers and say, okay, the, we do it for free, it will not cost anything. This is definitely not true. If you switch down, say, coal fire power plants, or as Germany does it, nuclear power plants, uh, and you uh, install new uh, energy uh, um, uh, producing uh, units like wind or hydro or what have you, then this simply costs money. The question is, of course, how much money does it cost? And this is a very schematic sketch I, I did here. Uh, so we are here today, and today's, oh no, as I should say, this is the cost of the, of the whole energy system per year, including investments, uh, fuels, maintenance, and all this. So for Germany, this is in the order of 220 billion euros uh, per year. And what, what we find today is the cost of the energy system is slightly increasing. Uh, maybe it's not a straight line. But then we say, okay, let's transform the energy system. And then we have to invest into grids, into solar panels, into wind turbines and so forth. And this will cost additional money. Eventually, maybe by 2060, the job has been done, at least for the first stage. And now the point comes and then I said this will be more or less flat yeah, because we are the, the cost will or prices will not be that volatile uh, because you have done the investment before and you do not rely on fuels because our fuel in photovoltaic comes directly from heaven, yeah, it's heavenly fuel. And uh, so this, this is the main contribution to the energy system. And the other thing is, yeah, point. And then um, how high will this peak be? This is another question. And there are assessment, there are global assessments I know, for example, from this report, Martin, you mentioned. Uh, so in generally, it is below 1% of the GDP per year. So this is a very rough number, could be half a percent, could be 2%. <coughs> but uh, for the energy system, it's as shown here, it's in the order maximum of 10%. And if you say the energy system costs 10% of the GDP, then it's in the order of 1%. So it's in principle, financial-wise, uh, it, is, it is doable. Okay, these were some general remarks. So where are we in Germany right now? And once again, an Italian would talk about the Italian system and a Dane about the Danish system. I'm being a German, I'm talking about Germany. So here we are. This is the, the history. Uh, of the uh, evolution uh, of the contribution of renewable sources to the German electricity system. Now I come back to the energy system. Roughly in uh, European countries it's one third, one third, one third, one is one third is electricity, one third is for heating and air conditioning and one third is for the transport sector, fuels for cars. So I'm talking about the uh, one third of the electricity system. And you see the strategy, if you call it a strategy for the transformation of the energy system in Germany, started in 1991, actually. There were the first, the Southern Roofs program. I have to apologize, this is, this is in German. Uh, I think it is self-explaining. Uh, this is hydro water. Uh, uh, and it starts with the first programs run by the government to foster the deployment of renewable energies. And the real feed-in tariff and the boom in renewable energy started in the year uh, 2000. Yeah, this is when this feed-in tariff really was established. And the good thing is this is really a federal law. 
So the government cannot simply change it. You need a ma majority in the parliament. So it's, it's really anchored, yeah, uh, law legal, legally. And the result is, as you see it right here, I have another slide on this. Uh, this is by the end of, uh, of last year. Uh, we had uh, this yellow bar, this is photovoltaics. Uh, this is biomass, uh, this is wind, and this is hydro. And what you can see if it comes to the development is uh, biomass is more or less the contribution is flat because of sustainability re uh, reasons. Yeah, this is biodiversity, uh, competition with food and so forth. And the growth and, and uh, hydro as well. And the growth is in wind energy and in photovoltaics. And as I see it, this is not the government uh, opinion or strategy. The main growth will be in the yellow sector in the future. And I will come to this. This is because of the fluctuation, the load pattern and the time pattern of, uh, of photovoltaics. So in summary, it looks like this. Uh, Germany has now energy. This is terawatt hours, not terawatt, terawatt hours. Energy, 25% from renewable. And of this is 5% from PV, 9% of wind. So that is 14% is fluctuating energy that is fed into the grid. And this is contributing to the energy uh, supply uh, of Germany. And uh, if you, uh, OK, this is electricity. Now I come back and say, because I need it afterwards, uh, the strategy of transforming the energy system is not only focused on the electricity sector. This is a big mistake many countries and politicians do. They just focus on electricity. It's so sexy, and we just talk about electricity. But it's just one third of the business of the energy sector. So you have to do energy efficient measures. And this is a slide showing just in an exempl uh, exemplary way uh, what has been done in the building sector, mostly heating uh, in, in, in Germany. So um, this is the, the building stock. It's in the order of 200, uh, uh, 200 kilowatt hours. So this should read here square meter per year. And you c if you divide it by 10, then you have the liters of oil. So these are 20 liter per square meter houses. And this is the building stock in Germany. And since 1994, we have a, a law, a code, a, a building code. So no building, no residential building can be built that consumes more than two liters per square meter. And then in 2002, uh, it was reduced to, um, to uh, seven liters. And now most houses, uh, houses being built in Germany are, are in this intermediate uh, region, say f five liters. So this is a reduction by a factor of four. The problem in this is the building rate of new houses in Germany is just 0.7%. So this will take a lot of years in order to really bring this down to, to, such, a, uh, to such a standard here. But there are other um, codes going on and really being active and part of the strategies for the transformation of the German energy system uh, that addresses the refurbishment of, of existing houses. This will be much too complex if I go into this in such a short talk. The point I have with this, I would like to make with this slide is it's not only about electricity, it's about heating as well and energy efficiency. But it is very difficult to install it because here you have to establish codes. You cannot have a feed in tariff on this or you have to give subsidies and you do not know whether these subsidies really work, if whether they are uh, used in a wisely way. Okay, now coming back to, uh, to, the, uh, no, to the overall energy sector again. So these are the, maybe it's of interest for you, these are the <coughs> targets that are in place for the European Union and for Germany. Maybe I'll focus on, on Germany. Uh, so in the electricity sector, so for 2020, the target in Germany is to have 35% of the energy, terawatt hours, from renewable energies. And this will mostly come, this. today we have 25%. This has to go up to 35%. And this will mostly come from wind and solar. And uh, as I see it, my personal view, so it will be balanced 50% wind, 50% uh, solar. And that means a strong growth in, in solar. And then, of course, you have uh, renewables 
increase in energy efficiencies and, and so forth. I will not go into detail right now. But these goals here, these goals you have here, they are really established by today's conservative government. The others are in favor in any case. And there are roadmaps behind it. Not only roadmaps with respect to the uh, deployment of wind and solar and biomass and heat pumps and, and so forth, but they are uh, with respect to energy efficiency as well. Will not be easy, in particular in the energy efficient, uh, efficiency sector. I do not see any problems in the uh, production of uh, electricity from uh, renewables. Okay, these goals here, they are weaker. There is not really a roadmap behind it and it will depend very much whether other countries or a lot of other countries, because there are some 20, 30 countries in the world who follow such a roadmap, but if the, the, uh, the emitters, the highest emitters or the most important emitters uh, follow a similar road route. Okay, the key behind this uh, uh, deployment uh, of renewable energies in the electricity sector is the feed-in tariff or the legal words are the Renewable Energy Resources Act. Yeah? It's really a, a, a federal law. Yeah? This is really in concrete or carved into stone. Nevertheless, there are always discussions in the political sector, like here in Australia, I'm very sure. Some people say this is nonsense and the other fight for it. But on the average, uh, it's, 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 going, it's going forward and it looks relatively positive. So this explains uh, how this feed-in tariff, uh, how it really works. So this is the normal, the standard energy supply uh, system. Yeah, you have consumers and you have the utility. Utility produces electricity, sells it to the com consumer. The consumer is happy to pay for it and the utility makes a profit because their costs are lower than the prices. Okay, now the game changes. Uh, the consumer or some non-utility producers uh, produce electricity and this is EEG, it's a feed-in tariff, this is the acronym for it, and they sell the electricity to the utility. And now the point, com comes, point comes here. For these EEG electricity producer there is a priority for the connection to the grid. So if I put some 100 kilowatt on my roof or 10 kilowatt then I uh, give the utility uh, a, rung, a ring and say, okay, please connect me. And they cannot say no. So there is, they have to do it. This is one of the key, the key points. And secondly, uh, they have to buy your electricity. There are some exemptions, for example, in wind energy, uh, some peak shavings or so, or if you put a wind farm in the open sea and then they say, okay, where is the cable? But Standard-wise, there is no problem. They have to connect you, firstly, and secondly, they have to buy your electricity. And then the utility transfers this electricity to the consumer. This, uh, so now you have gray energy and you have green energy as well. The next point is the utility has to pay you for the electricity that you deliver to the utility. And now comes the, the crucial point. You have some costs here for the production, say kilowatt hour, 15 cents or so, yeah? But the utility, and this is the feed-in tariff, has to pay you by law a higher price. So they pay you 18 cents, though your cost is just 15 cents. Now the difference has been much higher. I show you in a minute a, a, a graph on this. So you make a profit here, and this profit makes you move and install more photovoltaics and this is why the capital flows in to to install all this because it's not it, it's about the investments uh, huge investments yeah 10 20 billion euros a year in, in 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 europe where does the money come from so the money comes from these electricity producers and they invest because they make a profit and the the piece of art is then to level these these profit in the right way. If the profit is too high, then the market will explode. If the profit is too low, then the market will stall. Now this is, this is a risk. But this works smoothly and uh, this is a reason why uh, these feed-in tariff works. 
Another benefit of the PEAT-IN tariff is that you get this re reimbursement only and only if you sell electricity. That means if your system works. And the better your system works, the more electricity you get. So if you just put a subsidy in it, then you have some nice tiles on your roof and it doesn't work, or you're a rich man, a wealthy man, forget about it. But here you, s you have to sell electricity, otherwise you do not get this money. Firstly, and secondly, you would like to do, at least normally, you would like to do the m as much profit as you can do. And that means if you do an installation here, in, if you do an investment, you go through the market and buy the equipment that is the cheapest and the most efficient and where you get an insurance, for example, for 90% of the energy production for 25 years. And you will not buy a, guy, uh, a system from a guy who guarantees just 20 years. Okay, and these fixed tariff, the 18 cents in my, my example, this is guaranteed over 20 years. So there is a very simple calculation, an economic calculation. You, there is more or less no risk in it. The only risk is there is a lightning stroke and your, your system is gone. And you can have an insurance for it and most systems are, are uh, insured. And the other point is these 18 cents I had, yeah, this is what the utility has to pay you. This is decreased every year. So it's not for constant, yeah? So, and the decrease, I will uh, talk about this. This is about 10% or even 15% per year. So this puts a lot of pressure on, uh, on the technology. So this, the system might be good for this year, but uh, because in my example, it was 18 cents and, and uh, 15 cents, and then the difference is 3 cents. But if uh, uh, by law uh, the reduction is uh, one cent or one and a half cent, then the difference is just 1.5 cents per kilowatt hour and then it makes no sense to invest. So this is, these are the key points uh, be behind it. Okay, so where are we now? This is levelized cost of, of electricity. Um, um, this is more or less um, actual uh, investments in the whole system, including maintenance over the energy production uh, uh, calculated uh, for today's prices. And these are two examples. This is from Germany and this is for Spain. But this applies to Australia or to India or China as well, because these are the kilowatt hours per square meter and year, the insulation, and these are the full load hours in, in, in wind energy. And what you see today, this is the cost of the electricity mix in, in Germany and in Spain. It's, it's more or less the same. This is uh, coal, gas, nuclear. And you see with wind, onshore wind, uh, they are more or less cost-wise uh, on par. So wind energy in, on good sites are cost-effective and they can compete on the level of levelized electricity cost with the energy mix. Uh, solar energy is here, 15 cents, yeah. Uh, small installation, small means on a residential roof, 10 kilowatts. And this is larger installations, this is larger installations, say a megawatt, a ground-based megawatt system. And you see there is quite a way uh, to go to compete with these prices, but I will come back to this. Uh, so the uh, policy activities should be this, uh, most people don't like to hear it, to bring this up, to include the external cost. And we, yeah, all you, the researchers, have to bring, in uh, collaboration with industry, have to bring uh, this cost down. Uh, what you learn from this slide is, I come, uh, this is from May this year, I come with, a, uh, with updated numbers, they are considerably lower right now, is uh, firstly that there is quite a spread in, in the different renewable energy technologies. And secondly, uh, it, uh, it is uh, surprisingly higher in Spain compared to Germany. Yeah? Though you would say there is a difference from uh, 1,300 uh, kilowatt hour per square meter and here 2,000, the difference should be much higher. This is due to the fact that the interest rates due to the economic crisis in Spain is much higher. So in Germany you get 
uh, money for 5%, in Spain you have to pay 8%. So the economic conditions are very, very important and enter, and enter into this. And for May, the situation was this for small PV. You got this from the utility, this is 19 cents, and your costs were fi f uh, 15 cents, so the difference was 4 cents, and this makes the investors move. And this is why we have this boom in, in solar electricity. On the other hand, for ground-mounted system, it is 13 cents. This is more or less here. It is lower than uh, the cost of ground-mounted electricity. So this market is stalled, and maybe this is purposely done because we have a lot of rules of roofs available. First, you uh, use the roofs, and afterwards, uh, the 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 green land. Okay. So here we are today. Here we are today. This was in May. In September, now the module prices in Germany, on the average, yeah, you can buy module prices at half this price, but on the average is uh, 1.7 euro. This is the exchange relation here. System prices are now on the average 1.5 euro per watt peak. This is a seven or eight gigawatt market, yeah. So this is very, it's highly optimized and a lot of pressure under the people delivering the systems. And that means uh, in within half a year's time, the cost of electricity production in southern Germany went down from 15 cent to 12 cent. I, this will not go on forever, but this is the situation, what we have right now. And you might ask yourself where you find 2,500 kilowatt hours per square meter in here. This is in northwestern Australia. So if I just uh, apply my pocket calculator, then I would say in northwestern Australia, you would have an electricity price of six cents. If you go the same situation and you do one tracked photovoltaic system flat plate at not higher cost, of course, yeah, if you could uh, realize it on this cost, then the uh, kilowatt hour in northwestern Australia would cost you five euro cents, yeah, not Australian cents. And then you can go into the near future, and this is the assessment uh, we did in Germany uh, with in together with the industry. I think within the next years it is win, uh, within reach that you have one euro per watt peak. The DOE, United States, has a goal of one US dollar. 30% less than the euro uh, uh, for one peak. And then you end up with eight cents and uh, in, in Germany, in southern Germany, and five or three cents up on the upper left in Australia. Not that bad, but there are caveats, of course. Yeah? This is levelized cost of electricity. With levelized cost of electricity is well established to, to uh, compare different types of electricity uh, production. But it does not take into account um, the, the time pattern, yeah? uh, the predictability, uh, the dispatchability uh, of these uh, type of electricity production. And there are uh, big, big differences. And of course, uh, the real costs depend uh, on the political, on the, where is the mouse? On the, political boundary conditions as well. So this caveat should be kept in mind. It's not just the production of terawatt hours, you have to distribute it, you have to match it w with the load. And this is why we have to try harder. Yeah? All of you here at UNSW, we in Freiburg or in, uh, in Singapore to bring the cost uh, further down, but not only on the modules as it's shown here, uh, but on uh, the systems as well. And what is very important, uh, the cost of conventional electricity should be increased by taxes or what have you uh, by the government. Uh, the counter argument is now we have a free market economy and uh, let the market fix it. Yeah? And this is really nonsense because there is a strong market failure. Industry will not invest today in a technology where they get the benefit in 40 or 50 years time. This is nonsense and this is basic knowledge in uh, economy that market forces only work if there is no market failure and here is a strong market failure and governments uh, should, should work on this, yeah? whether carbon tax or other taxes or subsidies. I'm, not, I'm a physicist, yeah? I'm not an expert on this, but uh, we 
all of you and, uh, and the researchers and the industry, we have to pull this down by bright ideas, uh, good technology, but the governments should do, should do their job as well and bring it up. Otherwise, the transformation will not happen. Coming back to the feed-in tariff, I, I told you the main mover is the private people or the people uh, who install these systems, they make a profit. Uh, in my example, it was three or four cents per, per kilowatt hour, and this makes them move. And this shows uh, that this works. This is the financing of renewable energy installations in Germany end of last year. And you see 50% of the money comes in from the bank account of private persons and farmers. And then you may say venture capital and funds and business uh, comes in part from investments of private people as well. And the utilities, we have big four utilities, they just have a share of 7% of the installations. Yeah? They, for many reasons, they don't like it or they haven't moved in enough. But uh, if you say, for example, you set a quota, then you say, okay, they have to invest, not you and you or me. Yeah? But if you have these feed-in tariff, then you activate the population and the population, whether they are in favor of uh, renewable energies or not, they say, okay, I can make a profit there. At the bank, I get 1% for my money, and here I can have 5 or 6%, and then they invest at, at no risk with a feed-in tariff. And, and this is why this is such a favorable uh, situ situation. The other point is uh, you get the population involved. Yeah? If there are millions of roof systems now in, in Germany, and it's, it's more or less common that some people have it, some people not, and over a beer they tell the others, oh, I made a lot of money on it. And uh, whether you like it or not, uh, money <coughs> makes people move, at least uh, the majority of the people. Okay, and then, of course, uh, now there is no clock here. How much time do I have? Who is... Uh, 25-2, yeah? Okay, so I have... Uh, uh, 10, 15, say 15, yeah, <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay, uh, and here the blue bars show you the, uh, the annual uh, uh, installations of uh, renewable energies in, in, in Germany. So this was for the last two years in the order of 7 to 8 gigawatts, and it will be this year more or less the same. And now the problem starts. Uh, the uh, this was foreseen here, this growth here, this growth was, was foreseen, but then in 2010 and 11, the cost or the prices, the world market prices of photovoltaic modules more or less collapsed. Yeah? Over capacity, economic crisis and all this uh, behind it. And then the market shoot up and then uh, of course the government say, okay, we have to handle this. And now a problem comes with the feed-in tariff. Uh, and this is, you can tune the feed-in tariff only uh, in hindsight, retrospectively. Yeah? You see this market growing and then somebody says, okay, let's better push a little bit the brake. And why do you have to push the brake? And this is because you have to uh, include this or implement or integrate this electricity into the electricity supply system. Uh, what, what this meant is, out of a sudden, so to say, uh, a 10 or 8 gigawatt systems came uh, uh, into the electricity grid. And this is in the order of one nuclear power plant. Yeah? So Germany installed, in, uh, in uh, terms of photovoltaics, one nuclear power plant in 2010, in 2011, and the next will come in 2012. Maybe uh, a side remark, uh, Germany decided to step out of nuclear power. This decision was taken after all these targets were set, I, sh I showed you. So the targets have been there, the strategy has been there, and if this would not have been happened, Germany could not have taken this decision. Uh, so the, this, uh, the, the stepping out of, uh, of uh, nuclear energy is possible only because we have these installations. This is in photovoltaic only, and we have the same situation in, in wind energy. And now the, the problem is, of course, how you handle this. Yeah? By the way, it's the same with the carbon tax. 
if you have taxes, you never know how the market uh, uh, reacts. If the tax is too high, you will, uh, um, uh, you will uh, get a political uh, instability. <laughs> if it is too low, uh, nothing, nothing will happen. This is always, uh, these measures work re re uh, retrospectively. Okay, nevertheless, uh, the, the German uh, countermeasures are, are as follows. Uh, this is a graph of the uh, evolution of the feed-in tariff. Yeah? I told you, every year you get a reduction in the feed-in tariff, but then this tariff, the 18 or 19 tenths, are guaranteed for the next 20 years. Okay, and in 2000, where does it start? Uh, in uh, this is in 2006, so to say. No, but this is, yeah. We had a feed in tariff of uh, more than 50 cents per kilowatt hour. And then it was reduced stepwise, as you may see here, uh, stepwise, and now uh, it is 19 cents. So really strong reduction in the feed in tariff. And this put the pressure on the technology and on the companies to reduce the prices. And this really reduced, was one reason why it is done. What you see furthermore is this is uh, differentiated. Yeah, This is for small systems and this is for, for ground-based systems. Yeah? So you can steer whether you would like to have the uh, rooftop installations or whether you would like to have uh, the uh, 10 megawatt systems on ground or uh, uh, what you have. And you see this worked quite nicely and the market was not stalled. This is, of course, the art, yeah? So the government did quite a good job in, in tuning this. And in part, it was done in collaboration with the industry. This was funny, yeah? Because the government say, OK, if you don't follow us and if you don't negotiate, then, uh, OK, we will stall the market. And now, since we had this, this strong increase, uh, nobody had foreseen it of, of 7 gigawatts, 7 gigawatts, and maybe this year even, even 8 gigawatts. Now you see there is a slope in it. And what we have now, we have a reduction of the feed in tariff every month. And the rate of reduction every month is not constant. It depends on the installation that has already been made during the year. So if you are be one gigawatt, I don't know precisely by heart, then the reduction per month is 1%. And then it's uh, differentiated. And if you are beyond 5 gigawatts, uh, then the uh, reduction per month is 2.5%. Yeah, this is a lot yeah, if, uh, over a year. But uh, as, uh, as you may see from the market figures, uh, the uh, installation are still, are still going on because the prices collapse. Nobody knows what will happen next year, but uh, for the time being, it looks good. So maybe I, I skip these slides because of, oh, maybe, no, I don't do this. <laughs> okay, this is uh, the evolution, the red curve is the evolution of the electricity prices, the average elec residential electricity prices. So in 2000 it was 14 cents and uh, now it is almost twice, twice as much. And this is the contribution, this is the contribution of the feed-in tariff. This is included here. Yeah, this is because, and this step, for example, comes from, from these additional seven, uh, seven gigawatts. And of course, there is a fierce political discussion on this, whether this is fair. Okay, you have now here uh, almost four cents or 3.5 cents that the consumer of electricity pays in order to do the transformation. And the philosophy behind is uh, those who consume the electricity have to pay for the transformation of the energy system. But of course, if the market grows and grows, then there will be further steps up. Yeah? And the forecast for next year is that this will be 5 cents per or 5.2 cents per kilowatt hour. This is quite a lot. Yeah? Maybe we will have 28 cents, 29 cents electricity residential prices next year. And 5 cents is really the transformation of the energy system. And now I will not go into detail too much, but uh, if you go, uh, if you analyze this, then you say uh, 2.3 cents. This is really what would be the load distributed on all consumers 
if, uh, if uh, uh, the uh, uh, burden would be distributed to all consumers. But this is not the case because we have what we call industry privilege. So Germany is an exporter of goods, cars and electronics and, and what have you, and the industry says, okay, this is unfair, we have to compete with France, yeah, 70% of nuclear power. So the government said, okay, we do exemptions. And these exemptions, these are the red bar, they grew and grew and grew, and uh, now uh, golf courses, having a lot of electricity consumption and chicken farms, they are now implemented here. So I'm sure this red bar will be cut to 50%. But one has to see, one c cannot do it too much, yeah, because uh, y y there is a competing world and you have to be uh, uh, cost competitive. So for aluminum smelters, this is, this is a problem. Yeah? Okay, so you have to do exemptions, but this has been overdone. And this is even uh, more interesting. Um, this is uh, the, um, how is the, the feed-in tariff calculated? So you have, say, in my example, you had 19 or 18 cents. This is what you get as a person who runs a PV plant on your roof. Okay, but what is really the difference? Yeah, the, so the ceiling is clear, but what is the uh, to to which uh, uh, what is the baseline? And the baseline in the in the EEG law is uh, it is the average stock market price. Yeah, the electricity is uh, uh, traded on the stock market in, in in Europe, and you see if the stock market price goes up, then the difference gets lower. That has to be distributed. And if the stock market price goes down, then the share of money that has to be distributed to all the consumers increases. And now the point is, due to the solar energy applications uh, uh, deployment, the stock market prices goes down. So electricity gets cheaper. And this is because the peak power is shaved. Photovoltaics in particular reduces the peak power. Yeah? This was this morning uh, in the newspapers here in Australia that there will be a, a, a tariff uh, uh, adjusting with the, with the peak power. And the peak power, I will show you in a minute, is perfectly shaved. And this is uh, why the electricity prices goes down. The sto average stock market prices goes down. So the difference between feed-in tariff and average stock market increases. And this is quite a significant contribution. If I, if I go back to this, you see here, this red curve is the industry price. The price industry has to pay for a kilowatt hour. This is the household price, yeah? And you see there is a step. So industry electricity prices went down due to solar energy. And this is quite clear and it is well accepted. It's okay. So now uh, we have all these wonderful electricity, uh, 14% from uh, wind and uh, solar. And th the point is now integrating it into, uh, into the electricity grid. And of course, it's about merging energy and information technology to really bring this fluctuating energy into the grid. And I think all these points are well known to you. I think I will not go into detail because of price. But what we have today is we have a demand and then we say, Okay, utility deliver. Okay, what we have to do in the future is we have a demand and we have a supply and we have to match it. And we have to match it through intelligence. And this is what I say, merging information, uh, uh, merging thick power cables and the internet, if, if you like. And this is, this is a challenge we have to do. And of course it can be done. Yeah? For example, uh, what is practice in, in, in Germany and in other countries right now. You say I have, a, for example, a big cooling load in my company and I tell the utility, okay, you can switch them off yeah, for 50 minutes, for 20 minutes, for one hour. And for this, I, I allow the, uh, you to do this. And for this, I get a lower tariff. And then you can negotiate and then the uh, then the um, utility avoids to buying a very high priced peak power. And this is of course can go on, you can have variable tariffs and, and, and so forth. And you can of course control uh, um, renewable, fluctuating renewables as well, but downwards only, yeah, peak shaving.
yeah, uh, in order to avoid these big transients where the, your transformers or what have you uh, don't, don't like it and get too warm. Yeah? Okay, this works. So these are two, two slides of Germany this year, one in January and one in May. And these are measured data, hourly values, and you see the peak power in to both these days were 60 gigawatts. 60 gigawatts. The maximum peak power in Germany is 80 gigawatts. So these were relatively low peak power days. And then you see here in winter time, this is the fossil fuel on both sides. Green is wind energy, yellow is solar energy. And you see what you expect. In winter time, there is low irradiation in Germany and wind power takes over and a little bit solar. If you go to May, yeah, uh, then you have the, uh, the solar peak here. So the peak power you would have had before the solar energy installation is perfectly shaved. So the fossil fuel power plants uh, um, work more or less on CV on flat and the whole peak power is, is handled by the uh, by solar energy so the power is written here this is 30 gigawatts in those days now it is 33 already and uh, almost 30 uh, gigawatt wind and this peak here is 27 27 gigawatts uh, installed in the system I show you this slide because it shows it works yeah no power failure, nothing broke down, the, the consumer didn't notice it, yeah? And it, it went perfectly smoothly because if you have a large area, in particular the, uh, the solar fluctuations, they are perfectly leveled out over a thousand uh, kilometers, at least in, in, in Central Europe. So uh, this can be handled by, by the grid, and in those days we didn't uh, export too much to France or import it to France, so the import expert is perfectly balanced. So now the question of course arises, this is 14% fluctuating energy, yeah? Uh, how will it go on? So, but okay, you say 40% you can do, but uh, in uh, uh, 2020, 35%, yeah, is, is, is on, the, on the agenda. And then you can do computer simulation and see what will happen one what will happen in the future and this is what we did at Fraunhofer is an extreme model of future German energy system this will never happen this will never happen because it assumes that you have 100% from renewable energies and you do not have any import export so Germany is fenced electricity wise and uh, no uh, kilowatt hour from, from fossil fuels. All the climate models say, okay, 20%, we can discuss it. This can be absorbed by, by the ocean. Uh, but you can do such a computer ca uh, calculation. What is essential? That you do not analyze the electricity supply only. You have to analyze the, uh, um, the um, um, thermal system, which is one third of the electricity demand as well. And if you do, if you do such a system, if you do such an analysis, then you end up uh, with a model and a least cost model. Yeah, you can you have to do a lot of stipulations on on, 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 on economics. Then then you end up with a least cost model, which is less costly per year as the energy system of today. And, but you have impressively high installations here in wind energy and in uh, photovoltaics. This is 450 gigawatts in total. And in those days, the computer models say uh, the peak load is uh, 130 gigawatts. This is a factor of 2.5. So you have much more installation than the peak load is, even if you shut down everything else. Uh, so can such a system be handled? The answer is yes, but of course you have to uh, work on uh, the use of the excess electricity. And this is uh, the big task for the future. And this is the discussion uh, we have in Germany and in uh, some other countries right now. What if we go on, yeah, if we have, now we have, uh, uh, well in two or three years time, we will have 50 gigawatts, yeah, with a peak power of 80 gigawatts, just solar, yeah. 
and how do we handle this? And of course, it's it's about storage, yeah. And uh, the um, in very interesting outcome. The very interesting outcome is uh, that you have to store the energy, and this is the lowest cost option in heat. Very big heat storages. Yeah, uh, for cities, it is is possible. The Danes they have extremely good experience with this, and you use the surplus electricity to uh, power heat pumps, increase of 100,000 cubic meter water tanks, uh, the, uh, the heat, and then uh, do the space heating in winter time from uh, these uh, installations. You can do it, of course, only in Melbourne and Sydney and Adelaide and Perth here in, um, in, in Australia, but because it's not really densely populated, but in, in Europe, uh, it will work, and this is this is one of the main uh, of the main uh, discussions we have today: how to handle the the excess power. Okay, uh, if I look to my what maybe I skip the next slides and go to my final remarks. So, uh, prerequisites for an effective transformation is low cost generation. This is this is trivial. Uh, sustainable production. I haven't addressed this. But of course, if we go, we will have not gigawatts, we will have terawatts installation, and maybe we do not apply too much lead or cadmium in these technologies. Efficient integrating, uh, integration of fluctuating renewable energies into supply system, empowering the grids, of course, and storages. So there is, you have these smart grids, yeah, and you can say, okay, Leveling out, you have a, uh, a European Asian grids from France to Vladivostok with a big cable, and then uh, then most of these fluctuations are leveled out. Or you can say, I don't like this. I have storages in every house, and the truth will be in between. It's it's not clear where it will be, but in any case, market forces will not solve this. Yeah, there should be a master plan, and we we have to work on it. And I've said efficient. Uh, uh, use of energy, smart financing. I gave you one example because I was talking of about our experience in Germany. This is a feed-in tariff. This is definitely not the only way, but it's the only successful way. And international cooperation. If we do not embark into international cooperation, then we will not have uh, um, the. Uh, we cannot solve the problem of, of climate change and uh, other problems I have addressed. So. Thank you for your attention.